Okay, I'm going to get things started here. I want to thank you all very much for joining us tonight for the concluding event in our two part series entitled How Representative is Our Democracy? Two weeks ago, Ray Smock and Neil Barkas gave us an insightful history of the Electoral College and the consequences that this voting system has had for our representative democracy in the United States. You can view this event on the Bird Center's YouTube channel in case you missed it. Building from that historical foundation, tonight we will hear about the efforts underway in parts of our nation to reform the way that we vote, specifically a method known as ranked choice voting. We will hear from Dr. Mark Brewer, whose state, Maine, implemented this system for the first time in last November's election. As jurisdictions, districts, and states across the nation, including West Virginia, consider ranked choice voting, we will explore how these reform efforts are aiming to make our elections more representative of the will of the people. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to first thank the League of Women Voters of Jefferson County, who are partnering with us uh, in presenting this series here at the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education. I also want to recognize our volunteer planning committee, which was made up of Marianne Alexander, Lynn Yellett, and Debbie Royalty. The Bird Center is a nonprofit organization, and we depend on donations to provide free public programs, such as How Representative is Our Democracy, as well as civics education initiatives for teachers and students across the state of West Virginia. If you are not already a supporter of the Bird Center, I would encourage you to visit birdcenter.org slash support us and learn about some special giving opportunities that are ongoing this month as we look forward to Shepherd University's Day of Giving on March 25th. We hope that you will join us as a friend of the Bird Center and become partners in our mission of advancing representative democracy. We are excited to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Mark Brewer, Professor of Political Science at the University of Maine. Dr. Brewer's teaching and research interests focus broadly on political behavior and institutions with specific areas including part partisanship and electoral behavior, both at the mass and elite levels, the linkages between public opinion and public policy, and the interactions that exist between religion and politics in the United States. He is the author and editor of a number of books and articles in academic journals, with some of the most recent being Parties and Elections in America, the Ninth Edition, with L. Sandy Maisel, Polarization, The Politics of Personal Responsibility, with Jeffrey Stonecash, The Parties Respond, Fifth Edition, also with L. Sandy Maisel, Party Images in the American Electorate, and the dynamics of American political parties, also with Jeffrey Stonecash. He is the editor in chief of the New England Journal of Political Science. Before I turn things over to Mark, I want to again thank you all so much for joining us tonight, for supporting this two part series. And if you missed our first part, I encourage you to visit the Bird Center's YouTube channel and check it out. This event will also be recorded tonight and will be available in the coming days on the Bird Center's YouTube channel. And please do uh, enter your questions in the chat box and I look forward to sharing them with our speaker at the conclusion of his remarks. And with that, I am proud to hand it over to Dr. Mark Brewer. Jody, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Bird Center and uh, Chepper University for having me and, and um, finally thank all of you for coming out uh, this evening to hear about kind of this interesting topic of ranked choice voting. Um, before we get started on that, I'd just like to kind of circle back to something Jody said uh, in the intro, particularly about the, the uh, work of the Bird Center. Um, I think civic education for our young people is obviously um, incredibly important topic and it's one that unfortunately has been left to suffer a little bit in recent years. So any any organization, uh, institution, individual who's working uh, to kind of help improve that situation uh, is to be applauded greatly, I think. Um, one of the, the things that 
uh, concerns me the most. I teach Introduction to American Government virtually every semester here, and it's not all um, first-year students in that course, but it largely is. And it pains me sometimes to find how little they've been exposed to in the area of kind of civic education um, as they've as they've come up um, through their kind of uh, pre-K through 12 career. So um, efforts on that are are to be applauded. So. Um, my plan for tonight is, is uh, to take, you know, maybe 30 minutes or so and, and walk through um, some of the basics on ranked choice voting, which I'm, I'm sure um, many, if not all of you are familiar with at least the basics. Um, focus on how ranked choice was implemented in Maine, um, you know, the arguments for and against. Look a little bit at what the evidence tells us, uh, at least to this point, and the, the, the record in Maine is still, re is still relatively short. We're talking about um, two, two election cycles, and they're not even full election cycles at this point. So what does the current evidence tell us? And then, um, you know, where, where might we be headed in the future with this? And um, at that point, um, you know, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time to open it up to your questions. You know, I was telling Jody before, before we came on that for me, I, um, you know, one of the things that I like about doing, you know, kind of community events, uh, is the ability to kind of interact with the audience. And that's obviously um, a little bit different in COVID times than it, than it was in the pre-COVID era. Um, but I think, I think all of us are getting, you know, kind of used to Zoom, if not totally comfortable with it, at least used to it. So I'm very much looking forward to your questions. I wanna leave plenty of time for those. So um, with that being said, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty low tech kind of presenter. Uh, you know, in a live setting, I'm a, um, I'm a pacer, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm in my office. I'll try and stick to my chair. But uh, normally, I like to kind of walk and talk, and I, I, I don't really use a whole lot of uh, tech. And so I'm not going to do that tonight either. I just like to kind of talk to you a little bit and uh, then really hear what you have to say. So um, ranked choice voting is uh, a, a kind of topic that's been getting a lot more attention really over the last, you know, decade, maybe decade plus in the United States. And what it is simply is, um, you know, ranked choice voting is a, is a system of voting where voters, instead of voting for just one candidate and then having the candidate who gets the most votes um, among all of the candidates win the election, you know, the traditional first past the post system that um, most of us are most familiar with in the United States. Um, ranked choice is a system where voters are um, allowed, um, and then you can even go further than allowed, depending on how you want to set up the rules, you can require, although in Maine um, that is not the case, but um, voters are allowed to um, rank. Um, some or all of the candidates who are running for a particular office. So let's say we have four candidates who are running for office, right? Um, voters get their ballot. All four of those candidates are listed. And under a ranked choice system, voters are allowed to make their first choice. So one candidate gets the, the ranking of one. Um, they are allowed to make a second choice if they choose to. So they could give another candidate the ranking of two. Um, the third candidate, their third choice, they could give a ranking of three, and then the fourth place candidate, if they choose to do so, they give a ranking of four. And so when everybody's done voting under a ranked choice system, um, and again, there's variability here. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, right now I'm gonna ignore the variability and just kind of lay the bare bones out. So after the first, everybody's done voting, um, the ballots are tabulated first choice only for all four of our candidates. And at that point, if one candidate gets a majority, you know, 50% plus one uh, of the votes, the election um, is over and the candidate who gets the 50% plus one is declared the winner, right? And so there's only one round of voting. If no candidate gets a majority in that first round, um, the fourth place candidate, so the candidate with the lowest number of votes out of our four candidate field, that candidate is eliminated but the ballots of those people who chose the fourth candidate, fourth place candidate as their top choice 
are now going to be reallocated, right? So we would go on those ballots, we go down to who was that voter's second choice, right? And then that second, those second choices would go um, as first place ballots to the three remaining candidates. And once that process is done, you then take another look and say, okay, does anybody of the three remaining candidates now have the 50% plus one? If yes, that candidate is the winner, the election is over. If not, the third place candidate is now eliminated, right? And those votes are then reallocated again. Uh, we have yet to get to that point in Maine, right? It's usually the first person, the, when we've needed to do it, which has not been always been the case, but when we've needed to do it, it's usually just been one additional round, but um, you could get there, right? And at that point, the candidates now eliminated, we're down to two choices. Votes are reallocated, and now you would, um, by necessity under rank choice, get to someone either with a 50% plus one, or I suppose there is a, a wild scenario where you could have a 50-50 tie, and then you would have to go to the regular tie-breaking procedures, which uh, generally are decision by lot, right? So I guess that could happen. It'd be very rare to see that, but I suppose it's possible. Um, so that's what ranked choice voting is in a nutshell, again, recognizing that there's a fair, fairly high amount of variability there. Um, ranked choice in multi-candidate elections, uh, which is relatively, I don't wanna say relatively common, but is, is somewhat commonly used in Europe, uh, has been with us uh, since the middle of the 19th century um, in many places. Uh, starting in, I believe, I'd have to go back and look, I believe Denmark was the first place we see um, ranked choice for multi-candidate elections. And if you're talking about ranked choice in a, a multi-candidate or a multi-seat election, it would be called the single transferable vote. It would not be called ranked choice. It's the same thing. It's just a multi-member district. Um, so it makes its appearance first in multi-member district elections in Europe in the middle of the 19th century. It is eventually um, adopted for single member districts, um, actually by a professor at MIT by the name of William Ware uh, in the 1870s in the US, although um, it's, not, it's not implemented um, in the United States uh, until we get into the 20th century. Um, it is implemented for single member districts in Europe um, in the 19th century. Um, one of the misconceptions I think that people have about ranked choice in the US, right? A lot of people realize that ranked choice is used in many other places outside of the United States. And, and um, a lot of people know that it's been used outside of the United States in some countries for decades, right? I mean, Australia has had a form of ranked choice voting in place for a variety of elections for well over a century. And people generally tend to know that. Um, what they don't often know is that there is a history of ranked choice in the United States. If you go back into um, the 1930s, for example, you will see um, not a large number, but certainly depending on the year you look at in, in the 30s, right? And it would again vary by year, but if you look throughout the decade of the 1930s, you would see somewhere between two dozen and three dozen um, municipalities around the United States using ranked choice voting schemes for at least some of their offices. Um, we never see it at the state level um, at that point, uh, but we do see it in a number of municipalities. And there's a period um, in the kind of mid thirties where it, it looks like ranked choice is really gathering steam, right? That, that it's, being, it's being discussed in more places it is being debated um, in more places, and it looks like it's working its way towards increased implementation in a number of places. Um, that impression uh, may be true at the time, maybe not, um, but it, it turns out to not, not last. Uh, by the time we get into the 1940s, um, anti-rank choice forces uh, in places where rank choice has been implemented have gathered um, support and gathered steam. And as we go through the 1940s and the 1950s, we see um, in municipality after municipality that had adopted rank choice, it being repealed. And these places going back to the more traditional first past the post um, election winner um, to the degree by that by the time we get 
into the 1960s, um, only one municipality left in the United States is using ranked choice voting, and that's Cambridge, Massachusetts. Everybody else um, has done away with it. So um, it is true that ranked choice has never been widespread in the United States. It is not true, um, as I've seen actually in a number of media outlets, to say, oh, this is something that really is an early 21st century phenomenon in the U.S. That's not true. There is, um, you know, a, a almost century-old um, tradition of ranked choice at the municipal level in the United States. So I guess that's uh, one kind of misconception I'd like to clear up. Um, in terms of the, 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 the supposed pros and cons of ranked choice, which is, I think, really one of the things that we're all most interested in, right, and, and really uh, the important questions for us to consider when we're thinking about any possible um, revision or alteration uh, to uh, to the amending of the voting process, we want to be able to we want to make sure we're careful to consider pluses and minuses, right? Because one of the things I regularly tell my students is that any time you change the rules of the game, uh, whether it's for voting or anything else in in politics and government, you can have significant changes to outcomes. Some of which you anticipate, um, others of which you might not, and the failure to anticipate as best you can and, and be um, very kind of mindful and careful about possible outcomes or consequences of any revision um, can leave us potentially in a worse place uh, than when we started from. So um, when, when people talk about rank choice as a, as a positive, right, people are, are advocates for rank choice voting, um, you know, they regularly tick off a number of supposed pros or um, positive outcomes that, that we'll see from implementing ranked choice voting, right? And um, one, uh, one that's, that's almost always at the top of the list is that um, ranked choice voting is going to result in voters having greater choice when they go to the polls, right? Rather than having just a choice of A versus B, um, as is often the case in American politics. When voters go to the polls, they see one candidate with a D and one candidate with an R. Maybe um, there's, a, there's a, a third or minor party candidate or an independent, um, which is actually relatively common, was relatively common in Maine, even pre-ranked choice, right? Um, that's something I'll talk about later if people are interested. Um, but in a lot of instances, you don't see that as a voter. It's a Democrat and a Republican. Um, Pro-ranked choice, um, arguments say that under ranked choice, you're more likely as a voter to have a third or a fourth or a fifth candidate, all right? So that's, um, that's a one key argument in favor of ranked choice. Um, another uh, positive uh, that is often thrown out there regarding ranked choice is that it's gonna result in higher voter participation, higher turnout, right? You're gonna, by having more, and it's right, it, that's related to more choice, that by giving voters more different alternatives, some voters who have not much interest in kind of the standard Democratic or Republican options presented to them with these other candidates who are representing different perspectives, they may have their um, interest wedded more and might be more likely to actually come in and turn out, right? Um, the increased turnout also ties in to another purported benefit, which is rank choice voting, um, eliminating concerns over the wasted vote, right? I mean, one of the, the things that you regularly hear um, in a first past the post system as a negative, as a critique of that system is that, let's say I've got um, a staunch libertarian and this person um, doesn't really have, has zero interest in voting for a Democrat and has very little interest in voting for a Republican. And, but usually those are the choices they have. Okay, let's say that they finally get an election under a first past the post system that does have a libertarian candidate. Great. But under a first past the post system, this, our staunch libertarian very much is concerned about casting his or her ballot for the libertarian candidate because they're concerned if they do that, they're throwing their vote away because they know their libertarian candidate can't win. 
and they're concerned that by throwing their vote away, they may make it more likely that their least preferred of the two major party candidates wins. And so rather than voting their clear preference, they vote for the so-called lesser of two evils. And ranked choice voting proponents say will eliminate the wasted vote lesser of two evils necessity, right? Um, one, another uh, very uh, strong positive of ranked choice, uh, if it ends up being true that proponents put out there, is that ranked choice voting will produce greater civility in campaigns and less negative campaign, right? Because if, if you as a candidate in a multi-candidate ranked choice field want to be the second choice of your opponents, your, your, your opponent's supporters, you're, you're gonna be less likely to attack them. You're gonna be less likely to go negative on them. You're gonna try and be more civil to them, right? In the hope of saying, well, I know I'm not your top choice, but I'd love to be your number two, right? And that's gonna result in less, um, less negative campaigning. And then finally, um, one other uh, common pro that is laid out there for ranked choice voting, although I think we need to qualify this a little bit, is that ranked choice voting uh, can be less costly um, than um, other types of elections. I think that argument, in, in, to be fair, needs to be clarified that, and it often isn't, but it needs to be clarified that that is purported to be true only under election systems requiring a runoff. So for example, if you have a general election and no candidate gets 50%, you then have to schedule a second runoff election sometime in the future, right? And that's gonna be costly because running an election costs public funds. Um, if you do ranked choice voting, you have the materials in place to avoid that extra runoff. You've got the choices you need on your ballot. So um, it can be less costly. Okay. Now, um, like anything else uh, out there in politics, not everybody agrees that ranked choice is positive, right? There, there are critics of ranked choice, uh, and in all, in, in Matt, interest of full disclosure, when ranked choice was first being um, seriously debated here in Maine back in 2008 and 2009, um, I would have considered myself on the side of the opponent of ranked choice voting. And um, we can talk about that um, later on tonight if, if anyone's interested, but, um, the cons of ranked choice voting that opponents put out there um, also merit our consideration, right? I mean, one of the primary critiques of ranked choice voting is that it's more complicated, right? It's a more complicated system than simply picking one candidate in a first past the post system. And that could result in higher levels of voter confusion, right? And the research tells us that generally speaking, the more confused a voter is, the less likely they are to actually participate. So if rather than spurring more participation under ranked choice, it's not inconceivable that it could result in reduced participation, right? So that's one of the critiques of ranked choice. Um, another critique of ranked choice voting that opponents regularly put out there is that um, ranked choice delays results, right? That it takes time to tabulate the second, the third, the fourth round, however many rounds of ranked choice voting you need to go to, right? And so it's gonna take longer to produce results. Um, it could also be, some critics say, more costly, right? Particularly if you're not, if you don't, your state or your, your locality, whatever, whatever you're looking at, doesn't normally require a runoff if a candidate in the general fails to get a majority. If you just award the victory to the plurality winner, Ranked choice is going to be more costly because you have to collect the ballots, you have to you have to um, do the second round, the third round if necessary. So therefore, it's actually going to cost you more money. Um, another critique of ranked choice voting, one I think we need to take pretty seriously, is that it's often asserted that ranked choice voting, by necessity, naturally produces a majority winner. That's not necessarily true, right? critique opponents say that, that it will produce a majority of the votes that make it through the ballots that make it through to the final stage of vote counting. That almost certainly is not going to be all of the votes that started out with at least one person ranked. So in other words, 
some ballots will not rank all candidates in slots one through however many you have. They stop at some point. If a ballot stops before the number of rounds necessary to determine your winner, that ballot is considered exhausted, right? And, in, and it can be exhausted for other reasons too, if there's an error or if there's more than two rows skipped. Um, you know, I read the, the West Virginia legislation that's proposed, they've got a lengthy definition of what constitutes an exhausted ballot in there. But anyway, if a ballot's determined to be exhausted, it's excluded, right? It's excluded from both the numerator and the denominator. So it's eliminated it, from consideration. It, it doesn't have an impact now on whether a majority of votes are cast, but that ballot was still validly cast for at least one candidate and it is no longer being considered, right? So that's a, that's a concern and related to that concern. And this is something that I remember having lengthy conversations with on a variety of, in a variety of forums uh, when ranked choice was being considered in Maine, is if you get a voter whose ballot is exhausted and is then excluded, and the, re and the balloting rounds continue, does that result in a situation where the voter whose ballot is exhausted, their vote is now counting less than the voters who continue? And if that's the case, does that represent a violation of the one person, one vote principle? Courts have said no on that. Um, I'm not so sure that I agree with that, but uh, we could talk about that later as well. Um, now, uh, just kind of quickly, because uh, I know we're, we're getting close to where I wanted to cut off and jump to questions. So um, this uh, five, six page, double-sided single space document that I'm holding up in front of you is a timeline of ranked choice voting in Maine. Um, ranked choice voting went into effect in some races in uh, June of 2018, all right? That was when Maine holds its uh, primaries, is, is always in June. The push for ranked choice voting started in earnest in Maine in March of 2001, right? So it took the better part of 17 years to be in place. There were innumerable um, court challenges. Uh, there were innumerable um, efforts in the legislature to pass, to repeal. There were people's vetoes um, that were put for trying to get the voters to take it away. There were citizens initiatives to try and push it through. Um, this timeline is courtesy of the Maine League of Women Voters who um, was absolutely critical in efforts to educate the public on ranked choice and ultimately to push it through to completion. Um, but uh, I'll, I, I can make this link available. I'm not gonna go through it I, just in the interest of time, but the sheer number of twists and turns uh, that you see in the effort in Maine to get ranked choice implemented is staggering, right? And there's a number of times it's left by the roadside for dead. And I, I do wanna give credit where credit is due to the main League of Women Voters, in particular, uh, my friend Ann Luther, who was absolutely critical in pushing this through. The number of times she testified before the Maine State Legislature on this, the number of public forums, radio programs, uh, some of which she invited me on that she held, the, the, just the number, uh, the number of amicus briefs that the League filed in various court cases um, is staggering. So um, I'll, I'll share this with Jody. Uh, after and, and that way he can make it available for anybody who's interested but it was not easy uh, to get ranked choice uh, on the ballot in or to, on, on the ballot and finally implemented in Maine right um, so uh, last thing I want to talk about and then I definitely want to open up for questions is as I said uh, ranked choice has been in place since June of 2018 uh, for all state and federal primaries in Maine. So primaries for state legislature, both both chambers, uh, primaries for governor, um, and which we've only had one in that period, and then primaries for um, uh, all those state offices 2018, 2020. Um, we've had ranked choice voting in place, but not general elections, all right? Ranked choice voting is not in place for general elections for any state office because it's a violation of the main state constitution. 
right? And um, there's efforts underway to try and amend the Constitution. So far, those aren't going very far. Um, ranked choice voting has been in place in Maine since June of 2018 for congressional primaries and general elections. So for congressional races, House and Senate, we see ranked choice in both the primary and in the general. And then finally, um, as Jody alluded to in his introduction, as the, this past November, so November of 2020, ranked choice was in place for the presidential general election in Maine. It was not in place um, for the presidential primary in June. And the reason for that is that our governor, Governor Mills, delayed implementation of ranked choice. She didn't put it in for the primary, but she allowed it to go through with some court challenges for the general. All right, so, it's, so that's what we have at this point. We've got two cycles of state legislative and gubernatorial primaries, two cycles of congressional primaries and generals, and one cycle of presidential general to base um, impressions on, right? So looking at Maine, what do we see? One thing that we, I think we can clearly say that we have seen is increased choice, right? Um, at least so far, ranked choice voting does, has produced more options for voters in both the primary, but in especially in the general election. So if you view greater choice as a positive, ranked choice in Maine so far bears that out. There has also certainly been less concern on the part of voters about wasting their vote, right? Voters have regularly indicated that under ranked choice, they are much more comfortable voting their first choice, even if they don't think that first choice can win, because they can use their second choice to vote for the so-called lesser of two evils, right? And so I think there's no doubt that that has happened. We can also say that um, tentatively, in, that turnout has been higher in Maine since ranked choice has been implicated. And I say tentatively because, first of all, Maine tends to be a very high turnout state anyway. It's always in the top five in the nation. Usually it's second. Minnesota is usually the only state that beats Maine in terms of voter turnout. Um, normal turnout in, in Maine in a presidential cycle is well into the 70s. Um, even an off cycle, we're, we're sometimes in the 60s. So turnout generally tends to be high. Turnout was higher in 2018 than the 2014 um, off year cycle. And then turnout in 2020 was higher in the than it was in the 2016 presidential cycle. But turnout was higher everywhere in 2020 than it was in 2016. So I'm, too, I'm hesitant at this point to say to go too far on the turnout. Early returns indicate yes, I want to see more data on that, right? Um, we can certainly uh, see that uh, there have been a number of exhausted ballots, right? We know this. Um, I talked to um, former Tech Secretary of State Matt Dunlap and I said, you know, how much of a concern is this? Are we really seeing this? And he said, yeah, we're seeing exhausted ballots. You know, ballots are being discarded because people aren't ranking all of the candidates, right? Um, and if you are concerned about that, the evidence is that there's definitely um, exhausted balance, right? Um, so that's, those are kind of some of the, the assertions that were made, that are commonly made about ranked choice that we actually see evidence of thus far here in Maine, right? Now, let's look at things maybe that we so far haven't seen any evidence for, right? One thing we most certainly haven't seen any evidence for is less negative campaigning. Right. If you look at the 2020 United States Senate race in Maine, uh, which had four candidates, um, it was the most expensive campaign in the state of Maine by far. All right. There is by a factor of almost 20 it is staggering um, the amount of money that was spent. And it's also staggering how negative it was. Um, I spoke with people from both major party campaigns after it was over. So Susan Collins, the, the Republican incumbent, and Sarah Gideon, her Democratic challenger. And, you know, on both sides, they were just, um, went through the ringer on that campaign. We had attacks on spouses and it was, it was nasty. And Maine politics usually aren't nasty. So, so far, the idea that we're gonna find less negative campaigning under ranked choice, that hasn't been borne out here, right? Um, in terms of is it going to be less costly um, than a non-ranked choice system? No, um, because ranked choice in Maine costs more, 
right? Um, the Secretary of State's office, if they have to go to um, rank choice for a contest, they have to either dispatch the state police or private couriers all over the state. And Maine is a, a large geographic state, but incredibly rural with lots of small towns, many of which do not have electronic voting machines. And so they have to they have to send these people out to secure actual ballots, transport them to the state capital of Augusta, secure a room, organize a count. It's much more costly to do this in Maine, so far at least. Um, in terms of um, voter confusion, that's an area where we haven't seen any evidence for, and, but that's not a negative, right? That's a positive, right? We, that was one of my big concerns. One of the reasons I was, was, was somewhat skeptical about ranked choices, I was worried that it was gonna, it was gonna confuse maybe um, voters that are less experienced or less educated, and it would, it would intimidate them from voting. We haven't seen that in May. There's been zero evidence of that, which I think is obviously a very good thing, right? Um, and then I just circled back to the the, the uh, evidence for, I, I, I skipped over this, is uh, there is evidence for delays, right? When we've had to go to rank choice, we've had to wait to see the winner, right? And sometimes it's been days. Um, other times, if you factor in court challenges, it's been more than days. So if you're concerned about immediacy, there is some delay, right? Um, in terms of, I guess, one last argument that we've thrown out there that's been a little bit of a mixed bag is this concerns about ranked choice resulting in a not real majority so far have been relatively minimal but not entirely absent. So if that's an area that concerns you, there is at least some evidence for that. Um, now, just to, to kind of conclude, and then again, very much hope that there are some questions uh, from all of you. Um, if, I, if someone were to ask me right now, you know, based on what you've seen, you know, in the two cycles that you've been able to observe ranked choice in Maine, what are your overall impressions of it? Um, I, I, most of my concerns over ranked choice have been reduced, right? We haven't seen a whole lot of, of voter confusion. Um, things that I was pretty sure would happen have happened, higher turnout, greater choice, uh, less concern over wasting votes. I think those are all positives. Um, so there, overall, I'm optimistic about it. Um, at the, on the other hand, I, I worry that sometimes people see it as a panacea for all that ails American elections. Ranked choice isn't that. Right? It's not going to eliminate negative campaigning. It's not going to make elections cheaper. Um, it's not going to um, make things less rancorous and more harmonious. It's, it's just not going to do that. And my concerns over voter confusion aren't completely eliminated. As, because as I said, Maine is, is generally a highly civic participatory state. Some states are less so, right? And if you go to a state that generally has a political culture that is less, less focused on civic participation and turnout levels generally tend to be lower, it wouldn't completely surprise me if ranked choice knocked them down even further. But I think that's an open question, at least in my mind. So at that point, um, I, I went about 10 minutes longer than I wanted. So at that point, I'm gonna stop. Uh, thank you all once again for, for um, spending some time on a, a, what at least in Orono, Maine, is a beautiful Wednesday evening. Um, this is the highest temperature today we've had in, in uh, I think, about four months. That's good. Um, and thank you for coming out, and I look forward to uh, any questions that you might have, and hopefully I'll be able to offer something of use on them. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And we have been getting a lot of questions popping into the chat box, so uh, let's dive right into it. One of the, the questions that showed up early is you mentioned that ranked choice was used in some parts of the country as early as the, the 1930s, uh, but was repealed. What, what factors were, uh, or what arguments were made that ultimately led to doing away with the system at that early date? Well, uh, the primary, um, in most instances, I don't I wouldn't say all, but in most instances, um, as you might suspect, uh, you know, political parties weren't big fans of ranked choice systems, right? I mean, the, if you 
if you look at parties as institutions, it's it's very much in their, especially the major parties, right? You know, so the Democrats and Republicans. When I say parties, I'm referring to them here in this instance. If you're a Democrat or Republican um, leader, you don't want rank choice voting because it, it reduces the monopoly that your two parties really have on kind of the ballot in many instances, but also on on the attention of voters. So in a lot of these places where it's repealed, um, it was it was party leaders um, that were behind those efforts more often than not. Um, and there was also kind of a, a kind of slackening of reform zeal as we head into the, the 40s, or especially the early 40s. A lot of people had other things on their mind, of course, you know, World War Two primary among them. Um, so kind of a lot of the reform energy that we saw in the mid to late 30s kind of sputtered out and that allowed those those opponents to kind of um, reorganize and, and get efforts you get repeal efforts in um, but yeah parties I would say are the biggest were the biggest force behind repeal in those places where it was repealed and I think to to somewhat of a similar um, idea of, of you know forces of, of opposing ranked choice implementation uh, you mentioned that there is sort of there have been uh, court cases in Maine regarding the use of ranked choice, and I'm sure that that's not exclusive just just to Maine. So, how how have the courts tended to address uh, ranked choice? Is is there a, a constitutionality question at play in their decisions? Uh, in in Maine, uh, I'll, I'll speak mostly to Maine because that's really the cases that um, are most recent, and there really haven't been a whole lot of cases in the federal courts outside of the few that have been filed here in Maine in the last two cycles. Um, although the Supreme Court has weighed in and said that ranked choice voting does not violate the principle of one person, one vote. Um, but in Maine, um, the federal courts have said, and, and we've had both state and federal court rulings here in Maine. Um, the state Supreme Court uh, in Maine weighed in on the constitutionality of ranked choice voting for state elections. And what they said, which is something that I um, remember discussing, I think it was on a League of Women Voters radio forum, although don't hold me to that, but I, I think it was, was that under the state constitution, using ranked choice in primary elections for state legislature and for governor would be totally fine. Right, um, there was nothing in the main constitution that prevented it. However, um, there are there is um, there are elements of the main constitution put in place in the second early in the second half of the 19th century. I'd have to go back and look to get the exact dates, but I want to say relatively quickly after the conclusion of the Civil War, um, put in place that require um, state legislators and the governor to be selected by plurality, right? And so that's in the constitution. So the main Supreme, main Supreme Court said, well, you can use it for state races for primaries. You can't use it for the general, for state legislature or for um, the governor, right? And that's where we stand currently with that. As I said, there are some efforts underway uh, in Maine to try and amend the state constitution to allow rank choice for state legislative and for the governor's race. Um, right now we're in what's known as the short session of the legislature. I mean, Maine legislature sit for two years. The first year is a longer session. You have more leeway on what the legislature can consider in a long session. This is currently a short session. Plus it's a COVID um, altered session. They're not meeting in the state house. They're meeting in a big civic center spread out and the leaders are trying to really limit what's being considered. So that, that amendment's not gonna go anywhere this session. If it comes back, I suspect it would come back in the next long session, which will start, uh, it will start uh, in 2022. 20, uh, so um, we'll see, but that's what the main court did. Um, now, Federal courts in Maine have also weighed in. They've been asked in particular uh, by the Maine Republican Party and also by defeated former Maine Republican second district Congressman Bruce Poliquin who actually lost his seat uh, to now incumbent Jared Goldman in 2018 in a ranked choice election. Um, they've been asked, the, the 
they both asked, the main Republican Party and um, Poliquin's campaign, asked the federal courts to consider a variety of legal arguments as to why um, ranked choice voting was unconstitutional. Those arguments were pretty tenuous. Uh, and the, they were immediately dismissed uh, by the federal courts. They said there is nothing um, in the federal constitution or the state constitution of Maine that prevents um, Maine, uh, the state of Maine from using ranked choice in um, congressional and presidential elections. And if they wanna do so, they are free to do so and they're doing so. So um, the courts have been pretty dismissive other than the state general elections for legislature and governor, which is pretty clear. I mean, that, that, that constitutional language is explicit, right? I, I don't see any way around that other than amending the main constitution. Interesting. Um, so we had a, a couple questions regarding uh, voter, voter turnout in ranked choice, um, in elections where ranked choice is being used. And um, so there's a couple questions that speak about, uh, you know, does, does ranked choice sort of where, where it is implemented seem to correlate to an increase in voter participation, voter turnout? Have there been studies that look at voter participation among marginalized communities? Uh, when ranked choice is, is being used, if there's a perception that if the if your vote is more impactful, if, if ranked choice does make your vote count more essentially, does that correlate to increased participation um, from different demographics? That's a good question. I think I, I can answer, I can do a better job of answering the first part. Um, in terms of evidence of does ranked choice show is there evidence showing that the implementation of ranked choice increases political participation as in overall compared to non-ranked choice? The answer to that is yes, right? In, in Maine, um, again, I, I mentioned, you know, some caveats to that, but in Maine, certainly um, 2018 participation levels in the state of Maine were higher than 2014, which is the most recent off-year cycle where there was no ranked choice. And then 2020 participation rates in Maine were higher than 2016 rates, right? Um, there is evidence uh, from uh, the limited number of other uh, municipalities around the U.S. that have implemented ranked choice that participation has gone up there as well. The second question, which I think is the more, um, I don't want to say more important one, but to me more interesting in terms of what does it do um, among different groups, particularly, um, you know, maybe disadvantaged groups in terms of turnout, that one, as far as I'm aware, there's been there's been very little work on on that, and maybe very little because I think there's very little data on it to this point. The one the one study that I'm aware of, um, and I, I have that as well, not off the top of my head, but I could all, if anyone's interested, I could share that a link to that. Um, the one study I'm aware of that kind of gets at this question, but kind of doesn't, um, looked at whether. Um, the implementation of rank choice in municipal elections with diverse electorates reduce the likelihood that people would only vote for candidates of their own race. So that's not really the question that the the, the questioner asked, but it's it's kind of the closest thing I can cite because the hope was that well, if you have rank choice, it's going to make people more willing to vote for candidates outside of their own racial or ethnic group. If if as is often the case in a lot of bigger municipal elections, people tend to, voters tend to favor candidates of their own racial or ethnic group. So this study was done, I believe it was done in San Francisco. And the answer to that was no, um, there was, the data did not support that. Um, people were just as divided in terms of race and ethnic vote choice under ranked choice as they were under first past the post. So, um, but in terms of the specific question asked about what does it do for um, tr more traditional lower turnout or disadvantaged groups. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that address that because I, I just I don't think the data have been gathered yet. And I don't think that Maine is going to help us much on that because as you know, some of I know at least some of the people here are, are, are have Maine roots. No, Maine, um, in addition to being the oldest state in the country, is also the whitest state in the country. So um, I don't think we're going to be Maine's going to tell us much unless maybe we look at those few pockets of Maine, which are starting to see an increase in racial and ethnic diversity, maybe the city of Portland and the city of Lewiston um, might be able to tell us something there. 
speaking to the idea of, of how data in Maine can um, flush out some of the details around implementation of ranked choice. There was a question about sort of the, the um, negative, negativity in the 2020 campaign that you stated uh, in, in Maine. And, and uh, the question really is, does, do, you, do you think that that was um, correlating to the use of ranked choice as the system for the election? Or was that a symptom of the larger national forces that were going on in that election? That's a great question, and I absolutely hate that. I don't think ranked choice had anything to do with that high level of negativity. I, I, I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, we're going to assign blame for this massive spike in incivility in the 2020 U.S. Senate race in Maine to ranked choice. And that's nothing can be farther from the truth. Um, I think it had entirely to do with the national climate, but also maybe even more than that, the pivotal place that both parties saw that Maine Senate seat potentially playing right in in who was going to get to control of the senate right they, they, the Collins seat was at the top of the list for for democrats and their groups that were aligned with them um you know sarah gideon had so much money that she she finished the campaign i think she had 28 million dollars left uh in her campaign coffers you don't even usually spend that much in a senate race here um, and she had that left on the table um so i don't th i think it was it was the place of Maine and kind of control of the Senate, the national environment, for sure, had nothing to do with the ranked choice voting. But that being said, one of the, the biggest arguments that ranked choice proponents regularly put out there is, oh, we're going to have more civility. I think where you'll see more civility isn't necessarily the two major candidates, major party candidates with each other, is that the major party candidates may be treating the third party candidates or the independents with kid gloves right so you know under a first past the post system someone like the, to use the 2020 senate race as an example we had four candidates um we had susan collins the incumbent republican sarah gideon um, the then current speaker of the main house of representatives and the democratic challenger well both incredibly well funded you had a former Green Party candidate who turned independent because it was easier to qualify for the ballot as an independent than as a Green uh, by the name of Lisa Savage. Uh, and then you had a fourth candidate um, by the name of Max Lynn, who was viewed by many people as a novelty candidate, although he did try and align himself very closely with President Trump. Um, so those are your four candidates. In a first past the post system, I think Sarah Gideon probably would have went after Lisa Savage more strongly because Savage, every time there was a debate, people thought, wow, Lisa Savage is great. Maybe I'll vote for her, right? Um, and she's going to, in a first past the post system, she was inevitably going to be taking votes away from Gideon. Gideon, would, I think, would have went after her in a first past the post system. In a ranked choice system, Sarah Gideon kept the hands off Lisa Savage and all she said was just Savage supporters I hope you can you'll make me your second choice so if you're going to see the increase in civility I think it'll be from the major party candidates not not to even to all minor party candidates but to the minor party or third independent candidates they see as most closely aligned with them because they don't want to alienate those voters there's not going to be more civility among the major party candidates because you know Sarah Gideon knows that Susan Collins people aren't going to make her their number two choice and Susan Collins knows Pingree's people aren't going to or um, not, uh, not I said Shelly Pingree I didn't mean Shelly Pingree I meant Sarah Gideon. Uh, Sarah Gideon knows that um, uh, Collins people aren't going to make her uh, their second choice so um, I think that that can that supposed positive is probably overstated I think by supporters at least from what we've seen here in Maine so far. Speaking also then to that, the, the sort of ex, the data, the, the experience coming out of the last Maine election, there was a question specifically about what percent of Maine voters um, decided not to select second, third, or fourth. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't have that figure off the top of my head. Um, it is reported on the Secretary of State's website. Um, it is not, it was not a huge number by any means um, but it also wasn't zero and I, I, I actually meant to, to print those out uh, yesterday and then um, I had office hours <laughs> students, students came in in the in not, not, not in my actual office but we had zoom office hours <laughs> I kind of forgot to I forgot to do that but it, 
it wasn't a it wasn't a large number by any means, but it also wasn't zero either. So, um, and there are some. I mean, for example, there have been you know some groups out there since we've seen rank choice who have been saying um, to their supporters, "Don't rank any other candidates. Just rank me first, second, third, and fourth." And you can do that. It doesn't have any. It doesn't change uh it's no different than ranking your candidate just one and leaving the rest blank but that has been a kind of a strategy that some campaigns have urged their supporters to to adopt of just just rank me and don't rank anybody else right so um and we don't have enough data to show what that would do i think at this point i mean one of the things i think we'll we'll be able to do probably over the next decade as we get you know three four five six cycles of rank choice under our belts is we'll be able to really take a good look at a decent enough set of data and then say, okay, what can we really say that's something more than based on more than a limited data analysis and anecdotal evidence slash hearsay, which I think a lot of what we're still working on here in Maine, at least, is either limited data or anecdotal slash hearsay. Um, there was a question regarding sort of, you know, you've spoken about how Maine has has this really great tradition of being a civically engaged state when it comes to voting. Um, what, uh, you know, do, do you think that a, that some of that is, is attributable to group or state sponsored organizations? Was there concerted efforts for for educating people specifically about ranked choice? in Maine ahead of the election? Oh, there absolutely was. I mean, the, le the Maine League of Women Voters was absolutely critical in that. I would say they took the lead uh, for sure on that um, to the point where there really wasn't even another group that was close. But there were other groups doing it too. I mean, here on, on, this, on this campus, a number of um, student groups were trying to educate you know, their peers about what ranked choice was. Um, you know, I remember talking to some student groups. Um, it was asked to come in and talk to them about the mechanics, and so I did. Um, but the the tradition of, you know, kind of this highly civic participatory culture in Maine long predates ranked choice. And I think another thing that, that's critical to mention about Maine, which, which might be different than some other states. And so, again, you got to be careful when you try and extrapolate Maine out, is that in, in Maine, it is common uh, for not only for there to be third and fourth party candidates for governor, for example. It's also not unusual that they a non-major party candidate can win, right? I mean, Angus King won as an independent twice in the 90s as governor of Maine, and he's now won twice as an independent senator in Maine. Um, you know, Jim Longley won the state as governor as an independent. Um, we've seen independents not maybe not win, but play critical roles in who does win an election? I mean, one of the things, if I would have went through that main League of Women Voters timeline on pushing rank choice through, one of the critical boosts to rank choice voting in Maine happened in 2010. Like there'd been about eight or nine years worth of discussion about moving to rank choice and it was going nowhere. People, it, wheels were spinning. And then we had the Maine uh, 2010 gubernatorial election and it, we had three candidates, three, um, we had um, the Democratic candidate, a state state Senate president, Libby Mitchell. We had the Republican candidate who is a very conservative businessman <clears throat> by the name of Paula Page. Um, and then we had a third party candidate, um, Elliot Cutler. And Elliot Cutler, the independent, took finished a very close second place to LePage and the Democrat Libby Mitchell finished a distant third. Paul LePage won that election, which predates ranked choice with 37 point, I want to say four, but maybe it was one or eight, it was 37 point something percent of the vote. And non-Republicans, you know, non which make up the majority of the state, right? Uh, Democrats are, are the biggest voter registration group in the state, unenrolled voters, which is what independents are officially called here in Maine, are second, Republicans are third, and then Greens are a distant fourth. Um, these these non-Republicans, these Democrats and these unenrolled voters were appalled because LePage wasn't just a Republican, he was a conservative Republican. He liked to say, and I think this is true, 
that he was Trump before Trump, right? And they said Elliot Cutler had either not been here or if Libby Mitchell had stepped aside and told her supporters to vote for Cutler, we could have avoided LePage. And that gave the push for ranked choice voting a whole lot more energy, right? There was this argument of if we would have had ranked choice in 2010, Paul LePage would have never been elected governor, which I think is absolutely true, right? I don't think there's any doubt that that's true. Some people say that about 2014. I don't necessarily buy that when LePage was elected in 2014, but I think it's absolutely true in 2010. So given the fact that we've got this long tradition in Maine of not only civic participation, but viable third party candidates, either winning or having meaningful impacts, that made it easier to kind of sell rank choice to people because they're accustomed to having these multiple choices on the ballot, right? In a state where that's less common, will the, will the experience of kind of convincing voters be the same? I don't, I don't know. Maybe it will be, and, but maybe it won't. I just don't know the answer to that. There have been a couple questions uh, sort of relating to the infrastructure that's needed for, for ranked choice voting. Um, a couple questions about, you know, does this require specialized voting equipment? Does, um, when it, uh, is there a need for sort of more robust election judging or poll watching or auditing if, if that's necessary? And there was also a question in regards to the, the time that it takes to get the results in countries that have had ranked choice voting in use for longer, have they sort of made developments that have improved the efficiency of the, of the system? That's a great question. Here, here in Maine, um, the voting equipment that is used by municipalities kind of runs the entire range, right? You've got some um, you know, municipalities that have kind of state-of-the-art electronic voting machines, which are totally capable of, of tabulating um, multiple recording stuff on a data device, which then can then be used to electronically tabulate ranked choice results. And then you've got some small towns which still use paper ballots and a block box, right, that are counted by hand. Um, you, the technology is there, right, to, to make ranked choice tabulation, if not immediate, relatively rapid, right? So you wouldn't see a huge delay most places don't have that technology in place. So the initial, there'd have to be an initial outlay if you wanted to use that. There are workarounds for it. That's what's going on. That's what happens here in Maine, right? But those workarounds cost money, right? As I said, the, when rank choice is determined to be needed in a race, the Secretary of State's office has to dispatch couriers. Again, it could be either the state police or private secured couriers to the, all the affected municipalities they get, meet with the town clerk and election officials. They take the secured, um, either the original ballots or the memory device, if it's an electronic version. They then securely transport those to the state capital in Augusta, where the Secretary of State has established a um, specialized location. Votes are then stored there. Um, and then um, in a process that is open to the public, um, votes are then tabulated. And they can either be tabulated electronically if the record allows that, or they can have to be tabulated in some cases manually. That not only increases time, it increases cost. And I think it does increase the need for more monitors. Um, it doesn't increase the ranked choice voting doesn't increase the need for more monitors at the polls, but when it's being tabulated, unless you've got the technology to allow it to, to be fully automated, um, it does require more. Um, can that be gotten around? Sure, but th there's an initial outlay for that as well. Uh, and if you don't do that, then you are going to get these delays. And the delays could be, in Maine, generally the delays so far when they've happened have been days. They haven't been weeks, and they certainly haven't been months. They've been days. But could it be weeks? Could be, right, depending on, on how many candidates and how many rounds and um, so it could be longer than days, but so far, it's, if, if it's happened, then it doesn't always happen. But if it has, it's been days. Well, I certainly think, you know, all, all of us coming out of last November's election and having, not having the answer at, you know, 1130 at night <laughs> Eastern time uh, as to the outcome, 
perhaps you know that is something that we we've, we've gotten accustomed to, but certainly historically has not always been the case. Oh, absolutely um, not, absolutely it, not. Close to it. Um, no, agreed. And and one of the things that you know Matt Dunlap, who was the Secretary of State throughout this entire process, he has now been termed out. He's now taken over actually as a state auditor, so he's he's no longer the Secretary of State. But he was Secretary of State through that through this pretty much this entire process, and once it was clear rank choice was going to be used, Secretary Dunlap said repeatedly, it's going to take a while to get results. If we have to go to rank choice, you're not going to know when you go to bed and you're not going to know when you wake up and you're just going to have to deal with that. It, you'll know in a few days and I'll let you know when you know, but you're not going to know tonight and you're not going to know tomorrow. So don't, don't think you are. And he was very good about about. I mean, he telegraphed that at every opportunity, and so I don't I don't think there was a ton of concern with it here. But as you pointed out, Jody, with the you know the twenty twenty presidential election, not knowing led to a whole bunch of not only concern but I think ultimately problems. Right? It allowed it allowed um, you know kind of some dangerous ideas to to gain traction out there. Um, we've had a couple questions about you know sort of. Uh, are do, are there places, other states um, that are currently considering ranked choice? Where, uh, in how how widespread is the use of ranked choice at, at sort of this this moment uh, in the United States? So far, Maine's the only state that uses it kind of on a statewide basis, right? Um, there are a number of municipalities, still small but growing, um, that use it for various local elections in the U.S. Um, there are a number of an increasing number of states that are at least considering ranked choice right now, either for some or all of their elections. I don't know how many states off the top of my head. I know that it's double digits. Um, Fairvote.org would be able to give you a full list of all of the states and the current status. Like, like what is the current status of this effort? Is it in front of one chamber or the other? Has it been tabled um, for this cycle? It'll, it, they keep that incredibly up to date. I mean, fair vote is a, a pro rank choice group, right? So they're advocates, but the data that they provide is also um, valuable. So if anyone's interested in saying just how many states there are and what the status is, fairvote.org vo fairvote will tell you that. Ballotpedia also provides that information, but you have to wade through more stuff. Um, we had a question uh, about a here in West Virginia and specifically in Jefferson County, which is where Shepherd University is located. It's the county all the way at the end of the eastern panhandle of the state in the, the area that borders Maryland, Virginia. Um, yeah. That the in magisterial districts, there is a there is a tallying of votes, a system where um, each where people can select multiple candidates um, for magisterial districts in the county. Um, just, out, just out of my ignorance, what's a magisterial district? So I have that, I actually, let me see if, if uh, Chris is on the call here and if she would be willing to maybe, uh, she's the, Chris Kinsella, if you're on and, and willing to uh, share a little bit of the background to your question, this was actually submitted ahead of time. Okay. Uh, um, so I wanted to I want to give her the chance to share that if if she's on she she's in the chat room here but let me just see if she can appear um, I'll I will we'll wait and see if she's uh, able to actually uh, lend, shed a little more light on that question and if not I will send it to you in an email um, and and link you up with her because uh, I think her question was ultimately sort of where. How does that that system con compare or contrast with what ranked choice voting would look like uh, were it implemented in in those elections and other elections here in the local county? So yeah, yeah unfortunately, without knowing more about it, I, I can't comment sure. on that. Um, well, I I think that um, there are two questions that just came in uh, that are specific about not so much ranked choice, but um, understanding sort of, uh, I think a, a lot of people are curious about the the um, perhaps robustness of civic participation in Maine. And so there's a question about um, one was that does does Maine have the tradition of annual town meetings as there are in Massachusetts? And the other question was, um, what can sort of 
Um, does Maine have absentee balloting or is voting only allowed in person on election day? All right, so I'll answer the, the latter first. The second one, Maine does have uh, no, no reason absentee, right? So you can request an absentee ballot. You don't have to have any reason for it. Anybody can request one um, up to, uh, there's a time limit on it, obviously, but it's, it's, not, it's not terribly onerous. Uh, I think you can do it within a week. There's a closing date, but anyway, you, you don't have to have a reason. Anybody can request an absentee. Um, Maine also has early voting, right? So um, even so, if you don't want an absentee, but you want to vote early and vote in person, um, you can go to your um, town or city office during early voting period and vote early without a reason, no problem at all. Um, that even continued even during, during COVID when many towns had their offices closed, they did make special arrangements for days of early voting. Maine also has same day voter registration. So voters can register to vote when they show up at the polls, no problem, all right? Um, you can register, you can vote. So all of those things I think are, are important elements of Maine's high rate of, of voter participation. In terms of town meeting, uh, yes, Maine uh, has a town meeting tradition, uh, especially, and, it, and it's still present and prevalent among many of Maine's kind of smaller towns uh, in rural areas. I mean, Maine's bigger cities, and when I say bigger cities, that's a relative term, right? I mean, I live in Orno, which is near Bangor, which is Maine's second or third largest city, and it's about 30,000 people. You know, Portland's clocking in at about 75, and then um, Lewiston is right there with Bangor around 30. They don't have town meeting anymore, but a lot of the small communities still do. Um, the town that I live in, Orno, actually does not have town meeting anymore, but more, more municipalities do than don't. And I think that definitely contributes to the highly participatory culture. Right now, interesting enough, there's a, there's a fair amount of concern about, among particularly kind of old time Mainers that you know, co a lot of town meetings didn't happen last year because of COVID. And a lot of them aren't happening this year because of COVID and they've, towns have adapted. And there's been some concern of, well, people are seeing that it's easier to do this than to show up and have town meeting. Once COVID's over, are, are, they, are some of these towns gonna refuse to go back to town meeting? Maybe, right? I mean, I, I just don't know um, if that'll happen. I think that would be a shame because I, I think that town meeting is, is very valuable, especially in smaller communities where it allows people to get out and see and hear their neighbors and deliberate issues of the day. And I, I think it's incredibly valuable uh, where you can pull it off. I'd hate to see it disappear. So I'm hoping that it doesn't, but um, you can't tell, I suppose. Well, I, I wanna thank everyone for so many questions. We, we're at 8.15 right now and have been uh, going for about 40 minutes in Q&A. And I think it would be really appropriate to sort of uh, conclude the, the evening by asking, you, you mentioned early on in your talk that you, you sort of went through a journey of, of moving from opposition to um, support of ranked choice voting. I wonder if you would share um, that journey and, and sort of what were some of the deciding factors for you that changed that viewpoint? For me, the primary reason which has caused me to kind of shift my view, although I do, again, I want to qualify that and say that I don't necessarily know that the main experience is fully extrapolatable to, to everywhere, right? But I think the big thing for me is I, I worry about anything that's going to reduce turnout and make it more difficult for citizens to participate, right? So anything that, that could potentially make it more difficult, make it um, more unlikely that someone's going to vote, those, those kind of things make me nervous. And I, the voter confusion possibility under ranked choice did make me nervous. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, reading, you know, I, I understand this stuff, right? I read that West Virginia statute or proposed statute on some of that stuff. I don't know what they're, what, what exactly they're asking for. Um, it makes my head hurt. So that kind of stuff, if, if it's doing that to me, a regular voter, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do this, right? And so I was worried that it would reduce participation. The fact that it didn't here in Maine, that it didn't, it didn't, doesn't seem to have confused voters. It, it doesn't seem to have reduced participation. For me, that's the, the biggest kind of 
piece of, of evidence that went from one side of the scale to the other, right? And that was a big chunk. Um, I do have concerns about, continue to have concerns about the exhausted ballots. You could solve that by requiring people to rank all four. Although if someone adamantly refuses, are you gonna to toss their ballot out? You don't wanna do that. So I don't like that solution. Um, I'm not fully convinced that a voter whose ballot is exhausted and then at the same time the process goes forward isn't having less of a say than a voter who gets to continue. And so even if the courts have said it's not a violation of one person, one vote, because the, that voter whose ballot's exhausted had the opportunity to rank all of them, they just didn't do it. Okay, um, still means their vote, they cast a vote and it's not being, it's not being used in the final determination of a winner, right? It's, it's not, maybe that's not a concern for some people. That still concerns me a little bit. Um, but the, for me, the biggest, the biggest change was, you know, I held my breath. Are, vote, are people gonna be confused and throw up their hands and say, ah, I'm not doing this? That, that just didn't happen here. So for me, that's, that's thumbs up. Well, I wanna thank you so much for what has been an incredibly informative evening um, and sharing not only the obviously immense uh, research and scholarship that you've done on this subject and subjects around voting in elections, but also sharing your personal experiences with this and, and sort of where it, where, what that means for us here in West Virginia and anywhere else uh, where our audience might be watching from um, and considering, you know, what does voting reform look like? Ranked choice is obviously one of the options that's really being looked at a lot in various places around the country. And I think that coming out of this evening's program, thanks to you, we all have a much, much better grasp and understanding of what uh, ranked choice voting is and how it can um, potentially make elections more representative of the will of the people, um, or at least help us along that journey. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me again. It was my pleasure. Um, and uh, I, I am fully supportive of your, your goals of your center. And I think it's great. So again, thanks for having me. I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you so much. And before we jump off here, um, I do want to invite all of you to join us at the Bird Center for our upcoming program at the end of this month. Our next program is a book talk with um, Dr. Martha Jones, who is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor uh, and Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University. And she's going to be with us discussing her book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. That book talk is coming up on Wednesday, March 31st. Uh, it will be held virtually via Zoom in this format at 7.30 p.m. and head over to birdcenter.org to find more information about that uh, and to find out about our other upcoming programs here at the Bird Center. And with that, I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and thank you again for joining us and for your questions for Dr. Mark Brewer.